Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another week's edition of ZK Study Club. Uh, this week, we're excited to welcome back Ben Yi Chen, who's been a repeat guest here on the channel. Thank you, Ben Yi, for coming back. Uh, Thank and, you, Alex. Yeah, and this is joint work that he's done with uh, Professor Dan Bonet of Stanford University. I guess both both uh, Ben Yi and Dan are associated with Stanford here. Uh, and this is about Latticefold and its applications to succinct proof systems. Thank you, Ben Yi. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again. And today we will have a deep dive in this last fold, which is a new folding scheme that allows you to have a efficient proof system for really large statements, but also with post quantum security. So let me start with some background about ZK Snarx. I think uh, most of the audience of ZK Study Club are quite familiar with this, so I will maybe go over rather quickly for this. So what is a ZK SNARKs? It is basically given some circuit C, given some public input X. A ZK SNARK is a succinct zero knowledge proof showing that you know some secret witnesses that makes this um, circuit satisfi uh, statement satisfiable. For example, a typical example is that you want to prove that you know the pre-image of a hash. And in this case, this hash is the public input and this SHA-3 hash function is the circuit. And this pre-image is your, the secret witness that only you know but you want to prove that you know it. And usually a CK snark will consist of several algorithms. The first one is this setup or preprocessing algorithm that takes the description of the circuits and generates some proving parameters and verification parameters for the circuits. And later a prover, uh, there is a prover algorithm that takes the, some public input and some secret witnesses and will be able to generate a proof. And there is also a verification algorithm that takes this proof takes the public input and check whether proof is valid or not. So you also need to satisfy several properties. First, for an honest prover that does know some secret witnesses for this public input, it should be able to generate a correct proof that passes the verification. And this is called completeness. And second, for a malicious prover, suppose he's able to pass the verification and uh, uh, let the verification um, like accept then that would imply that he actually knows some secret witnesses for these particular statements. Here by knowing, I mean, more formally, there means that there exists some algorithm, extractor algorithm that can extract this witness from a black box access to this malicious proof. Sometimes we also need the uh, property called zero knowledge, meaning that this proof should, should not reveal information of secret witness. But in this talk, my main focus is another very, very nice feature of SNARKs, which is saying that this proof should be really short and easy to verify. And this is also the key feature that makes this SNARK super useful in practice, and which is, enables a lot of really nice application for scaling blockchain uh, and obtain, like, for obtaining verifiable machine learning or fully homomorphic encryption and other very exciting uh, applications. But for this many sophisticated and exciting applications, there's a key challenge here in the sense that a prover needs to generate a proof for some really computationally expensive uh, computation statements. For example, machine learning inference or ZK EVM transactions, those are really some complicated uh, tasks that you want to prove. And the goal here is to enable this proving as fast as possible, which is actually not that easy. So let me start with some background about uh, SNARKs. And in the literature, there are many really um, nice and uh, elegant schemes for SNARKs, both in the pre-condom setting and in the post-condom setting. And I would call them all as a monolithic SNARKs, which means that you can generate a proof all at once given certain statements. And they all follow these kind of patterns here. So you start with some MP computation statements you want to prove. And what you do is that we will really ask you this kind of computation to obtain some uh, computation trace and then you translate this computation trace using some algebraic transform like FFT to, to transform them into some polynomial representation, for example. And that will lead to some extended witness, which basically is a very long vector of field elements. And only after that, the prover has to do some global computation over this large extended witness. And this includes for example, FFTs or multi-scalar applications or error correcting encoding and so on. And the issue here is that when it comes to prove some computationally expensive statements, and this extended witness will be super, super large because the computation trace can be very long. 
And then this will make this global computation really, really expensive. And moreover, because this witness has to take as an input as a whole, usually the prover also needs to have really large memory and it can be easily run out of memory if this statement is large. And also because of this uh, kind of, you need to do some global computation over the entire witness and this algorithm like FFTs, they're actually not that easy to be parallelized, uh, parallelization friendly. So it makes also harder to, for engineers to make it more parallelization friendly and streaming friendly. So this is some limitations for these kind of schemes for those really, really computationally expensive statements. So given that an alternative strategy is to um, build a piecemeal SNARK, which is based on this P, uh, IVC and the PCD uh, uh, scheme strategies. So at a very high level, the idea is to slice this large computation into many pieces, okay? For example, if you want to prove that you know 10,000 per image of 10,000 hashes, you might chunk them into 1,000 chunks and each chunk statement is just responsible for proving 10, um, 10 per image separately. But in general, this is not quite trivial. Like how do you transform any general circuit statements, computation statements into many small chunk of statements? But that's not the goal of this talk. And I will like refer it to our recent work, Mangrove and some other work, and to tell you that this is doable and can actually do, um, be achieved in a very efficient way. But in this call, let's just assume that that's possible. And we can slice this large computation into many small pieces. And now the goal is to prove that all these small pieces are satisfiable, all right? So now in this case, we have these many, uh, many shaded rectangles here, which are the split statements you want to prove. And how do you do that? The idea is to prove the, the uh, correctness of these chunk statements using a re snark recursion strategy. So for example, given these many statements, you can build a binary tree out of it. And you start from the leaf layer and for every leaf statement, you will generate a proof for these leaf statements. For example, for chunk statement one and chunk statement two, you'll get some proof pi one, pi two for that. And then later for the parent nodes, you'll generate another recursive proof for that. And this recursive proof is this pi two star here, which, which will check two things. So the first is that this chunk statement three located at its nodes is satisfiable. But additionally, it will also, this snark circuit will also check that this proof of its children are correctly verified. So this implies that all the statements in this small subtree are correctly verified and is satisfiable. And you can do this uh, one more time and go layer by layer and finally obtain a single small proof that implies all the statements inside this large tree are satisfiable. So this is how it works. And it has, has this obvious advantage for having much smaller memory overhead because the memory requirements is only proportional to the single chunk statements rather than the entire large statements. And second is also more streaming and parallelization friendly because you can compute proofs along each path of the tree without affecting other uh, non-overlapping uh, paths. However, this kind of strategy is actually not widely used in practice because um, until very recently, this recursion is actually pretty expensive. Why? Because first, for every node here, you have to generate a recursive snark proof, right? And snark proof generation is not cheap, and you have to do it for so many times, so it's expensive. And second, for every recursive proof you generate, it, the corresponding recursive statements not only includes these chunk statements, but also needs to embed this snark verification logic inside. But usually, a snark verification um, the circuits for snark verification is usually quite concretely expensive. So that makes things much more co um, complicated and expensive. So given this, many recent work trying to build a primitive called folding scheme to reduce the recursion overhead. But before I explain what the folding scheme is, let me um, like give some background about the committed MP relation, which would be very useful in folding schemes. So say we have some MP relation R, and here the goal for us is transform to somewhat equivalent relation R prime here. And in R prime, the instance is um, slightly different. Well, we will insert a small commitment C inside this public in, uh, inputs. And we say that this tuple X prime W is in this transform relation if and only if the original X W is in this relation R, but moreover, the witness is a correct opening to the commitments. 
So whenever you want to prove XW in R is equivalent that you can just, if it is sufficient for you to just prove that X prime W is in R prime. Okay, so you will know, you'll, you'll be clear why we need this very soon, but for now, for simplicity of the notation in the following slides, I will omit this public input part just for simplicity, but you should bear in mind that usually when I say CW, I actually also there should be a public input inside this uh, instance part. Okay, so after knowing this background about the committed MP relation, let's see what exactly a folding scheme is. So in a folding scheme, the folding prover has access to two uh, committed MP relation statements. And his goal is to convince the verifier that I know the correct witness of these two MP statements. For example, here it would be this W1, W2 here. Okay. And to do that, they will run some lightweight and usually public coin interactive protocols. And at the end of this protocol, if the verifier accepts, then he will be able to obtain and output a single folded instance, which is CFD here. And the corresponding prover should be able to output a corresponding correct witness for that. So in some sense, you can see that this kind of interact protocol allows us to reduce the checking of these two initial MP com uh, committed MP statements into the checking of this one last folded uh, instance with spare checking. And that's what the name of folding scheme comes from. And it also needs to satisfy some similar completeness and knowledge soundness uh, notions, which means that in an honest execution for an honest prover who does know to a correct witness for the input instance, then after running this protocol, he should be able to output WFD that's in the relation in output uh, statements, uh, like output relation here. And knowledge sounds is saying that even if the prover is malicious, okay, he can do anything he wants. And suppose he's able to pass verification and finally output some correct witness, then that implies he actually also know the correct witness for these two input um, instance here. So he should actually know some correct W1, W2. So this is somewhat similar to SNARKs, but you can see this is kind of a weaker notion of SNARKs. And that's also the reason finally we can obtain some more efficient uh, schemes to folding rather than for SNARK. And you can even generalize this notion further to, uh, to get this notion for reduction knowledge protocol, uh, which says that this basically is a protocol that allows you to reduce the checking of any input uh, statements in this relation R1 into the checking of some output statements in relation R2. So if you look more closely, you can find that folding scheme is just a special case where R1 is defined to be R times R and R2 is R. And the goal is to reduce the checking of two statements in R into the checking of one statement in R. So that's some background about folding scheme. And after knowing that, let's see why we can build a more efficient piece misnark from folding scheme. And let's still assume that we are able to slice this really large computation into many small pieces. And now our goal is to prove that all these pieces are uh, satisfiable. And here, let's for simplicity, just consider a chain. And now what the snark prover will do is the following. So he will initialize some statements uh, or instance with pair uh, he'll use, usually it's just commitment to some um, like zero vector or something. And then at each step, what he will do is that he will run this folding prover algorithm. Usually this is, is some algorithm that um, make this protocol pi we said before to be non-interactive using via Shamir. And he will run this protocol, uh, run this proving algorithm and obtain a updated folded instance with this pair that's merged these first chunk statements uh, inside. And he'll do this again for the second step, which involves the second chunk statements. And he'll do this again and again for n times. Finally, obtain a final folded instance with this pair here. And that will be served as a proof here and sent to the verifier. And the verifier now only needs to check that this last statements or instance with this pair is inside these chunk statements. And by the property of folding scheme, this implies that prover actually should know all the correct witnesses for all the n chunks, which implies that it actually know the witnesses for the original large computation. But there is a one minor issue here in the sense that uh, how does verifier guarantee that the prover is giving you the correct folded commitments or folded instance here, right? What if you just choose some other arbitrary um, 
for the instance that's unrelated to C1 to Cn, right? But this is actually easy to fix. What you do is that we will define some public inputs, which is some trusted public inputs, which is the chain hash of these uh, instances here. And then the prover will additionally send all these uh, instances that he wants to prove C1 to Cn. And the verifier now only needs to check that C1 to Cn are consistent with this trusted public inputs and recompute these folding commitments herself by calling these folding verifier algorithms. Okay, so that's will ensure that CFDN is that that's the verifier finally check is always the correct one. But the, it has some caveats here in the sense that the verifier complexity is at least linear to the number of chunks here, right? So when the number of chunks is large, this actually amounts to a large and complex, uh, like expensive verifier. But it turns out we can do much better and remove the dependence on the number of chunks. The idea is just to delegate this iterative computation done by the verifier into the relation you want to fold. So that means that after you fold this relation, if you check the last relation holds true, then you can also make sure that this, this kind of computation uh, is done correctly and the CFDN is computed correctly. So more precisely, what we do is that as same as before, the snack proofer at each, each folding step will fold two instances with its pair into one new uh, folded instance with its pair. And then at the next folding step, he'll generate another uh, instance with its pair for a new statement. And this new statement is slightly different from before. Well, beyond checking that this chunk statement at the I step is correct, He'll additionally check that this public uh, input hash check is correct and this folding verification was done correctly, meaning that the newly outputted uh, folded commitment is correctly computed from the previous one and the previous uh, like online commitments. And this ensures that after you check the last folding step, all the, uh, all the computation were done correctly, including this folding verification, and that implies the CFDN is always the correct one we want. Okay, so that is about correctness, but why is much, much faster and much more efficient than the snark recursion, right? The TLDR is because a folding scheme usually can be much simpler than a snark. If you look at more closely, you can find that folding verifier usually just involves a linear combination of some small uh, commitments, okay? And this is much simpler than a snark verifier, and that means these folded, uh, these statements you want to fold is much simpler than these recursive statements you want to prove previously. And beyond that, you see that at each step, the folding prover, what he does is just to do a linear combination over a weightless vector, which is far more, uh, like far faster than the snark prover algorithms. So that also is the main reason that why folding can be much, much faster than a recursive uh, snarks. Okay, so that's the reason why we why we prefer folding scheme. And now the question is why uh, whether we can have a really efficient folding scheme. And the folding scheme usually uh, we are involved with a committed MP statements. Usually they are commit they're folding these committed MP statements. So you have to instantiate the commitment. And there are two key properties you want from these commitments. First is that there are allows you to compress a long witness into a short string. And second it is also nearly homomorphic. In the sense, uh, in, in the sense that the addition, for example, the additional commitments is the commitments of the addition of the witness, and that allows the folding verifier to do very simple uh, check over the commitment space rather than the expensive message space. So prior to our work, all the schemes are using Peterson commitments, and because they are nearly homomorphic, they're transparent. However, they also have some limitations here in the sense that first they are based on this discrete log assumption that's vulnerable to some quantum attack. So it's not post quantum secure. And moreover, uh, in terms of efficiency, they also have some kind of limitations. So usually if you want to build an IBC or PCD, if you want this scheme to be relatively efficient, you have to use a cycle of, uh, like a cycle of pair of curves. And these kind of curves are usually harder to find and uh, also less efficient than regular curves. And second, because of the use of Pearson commitments, that means that proofery also needs to do some uh, elite curve scale multiplication over a really large scalar fields, right? Usually the two, two, uh, 256 piece fields. And that can also be quite expensive. 
And it's also very wasteful because usually what you do is that we embed this data, the real like program execution data into this scalar field. But usually the real world data is only uh, like some small integers, like 32 bit integers. So it's kind of wasteful as well. And finally, in terms of these folding verified circuits, it's definitely more efficient than a snark verified circuit. However, it still has some uh, kind of uh, overhead here. First, it needs to embed like a few elite curve scale modification inside, which is expensive. But moreover, um, because you have to embed this elite curve scale modification, that means the circuit is over the base field of the curve. But this verify also involves some field operation over the scalar field of the curve. That means you have to implement some arithmetic over the scalar fields as a circuit over this different base field that can blow up the circuit sizes. So you may wonder, like an acute read, uh, reader or audience might wonder, why not just use a hash-based proof system, right? And do, do snark recursion. So in that sense, all the things are over a single field, like these really nice Fry-based schemes are only over, work over a single field. But however, that would require you to do a full snark recursion, which as I mentioned before, full snark recursion usually is more uh, expensive than this folding-based uh, piecemeal snark. Uh, because folding scheme usually is much more efficient than a full snark. So given this, my question uh, is whether we can achieve the best of both worlds, right? Whether we can still use this folding-based piece from a snark construction uh, and build a sound folding scheme, but can we get rid of these kind of issues that we had uh, like for now? So whether we can have folding scheme that has post column security, has ultra fast prover, and moreover has this succinct verified circuits that removes the need of doing any non-native field emulations? And the answer is yes. And this is uh, our work, Let's Fold, which is the first lattice space folding scheme that uh, is based on this MC's assumption, which is believed to be quantum resistant. And moreover, and it, even compared to those pre-quantum folding schemes, it has very, very, very competitive efficiency. And I'll explain why this case in the end of the talk. Okay, uh, one thing to note here is that it moreover, it also supports these kind of relatively small fields compared to Peterson schemes that we on, you on, can only use this really large uh, field. Okay, and finally, I want to mention that our scheme is like the constraint system, corresponding constraint system, or the circuit is actually over a ring, like polynomial ring. And that means you can natively simulate those operations that's done over rings, for example, fully homomorphic encryptions or some machine learning tasks. And that makes this more friendly for this for simulating these applications, which is another uh, nice feature for these schemes. Okay, so uh, from this, I already explained what our background about folding scheme, and now I want to go to more technical part and see how we can actually build a folding scheme for this MP relation that allows you to do IVC. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, no questions in the chat. Thanks, Benny. This is a great okay, cool. so far. Cool. Nice. Okay, so let's go to the technical part. Now I want you to build the folding scheme. And for simplicity in this talk, I'll just focus on a slightly simpler question. Well, I'll just focus on uh, folding this commitment opening relation, which is checking that the witness is a correct opening to a corresponding commitments. Okay, to do that, the first question uh, we ask, or the first question we need to answer is what kind of commitments you want to use now? Right. Remember, we want to instantiate some commitments that allows that has these two really really nice property. First, it allows you to compress a long witness string into a short string, which is commitments. And second, it should be linear homomorphic. And in the last words, this will be anti-binding commitments or anti-collision resistant hash functions. And what is the anti-binding commitment? Oh, by the way, I will focus on the binding property and ignore the hiding property of commitment schemes, but you can extend that easily. So what is I-type binding commitments? The message space of the I-type binding commitments is slightly different from this Peterson construction. So the message space is actually uh, an integer vector such that every entry has some constraints. It's a subset of this ZQ to the N space where every entry has to be have very small absolute values. For example, inside this range of minus beta to beta where beta is some small parameters. An extreme example is just, you consider message space as just a binary string Okay, and so your goal is to commit this uh, long string into a short vector, and what you do is to multiply this 
uh, vector by some public random matrix A here over ZQ, where Q is a prime modulus. And that will lead to a really short string because this matrix is quite narrow. And so it satisfies compressing property, which allows you to compress a long vector into a short string. And it's also binding. Well, what is binding? Binding is saying that it's infeasible to find two opening of the same commitments, okay? And this is, comes from this uh, cis assumption, which says that given a public random matrix A, it should be hard to find a no known vector X such that AX equals zero. And why it leads to binding property? Suppose the contradiction, we have two vector U and W that maps to the same commitments, then U minus W will satisfy that A times U minus W is zero, right? And moreover, U minus W is some no known vector because both U and W are no known vector. So this will break the cis assumption and that's why uh, it is binding. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? Uh, I was just posting the um, the Ashai papers. Oh, I see. Thank you. Cool. And moreover, it satisfies this linear homomorphic property, which is quite straightforward uh, by the, this linearity of matrix multiplication. Uh, but one thing to mention here is that I only support those uh, small efficient linear combinations. So you need to make sure that this coefficient is small and also the message uh, in this linear combination is very small. So you see here, this is kind of somewhat rigged, right? Well, you have to make sure that this witness is actually a known norm. So, uh, oh, by the way, I also want to mention that in practice, this is actually not gonna be efficient, but there's an efficient instantiation where you replace this integer or in ZQ with some cyclotronic polynomial ring so that you can pack more elements inside ring elements and you can replace this expensive matrix multiplication with some uh, ring multiplications, which can be very efficient using NTT. And that's why in practice, this attack collision with half function is actually can be really, really fast given some correct uh, optimization and uh, implementations. Okay, so one thing to note here is that this, uh, we have some constraints here that the witness should have no norm. But you might want to ask, right? Usually in an MP relation, the witness should be arbitrary, right? It should be some arbitrary elements in the ring or arbitrary elements in the field. So how do you actually commit this witness with large norms? So I will give a word about how we deal with it in our final solution. So the idea here is we will slightly change this commitment opening relation for that. So in this, in this relation, the instance is still includes these short commitments, but witness will have two parts. The first part is the original witness that have no norm constraints. And the second part is this V here, which is like the gadget decomposition of the original witness that will have low norm. For example, you consider element seven, it can be represented as one, 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 right? Which is this binary decomposition of this seven we're using this gadget uh, vector one, two, three. So given that you can, what we do is that we want to check that the commitment C is a commitment to this no normal vector V that has more norms, but moreover, the original witness W have this kind of gadget matrix relation with the, this uh, decomposed vector. And that's enough. And in our final solution, we will build a phone scheme for some MP complete relation that involves like, that includes this kind of uh, relation. And the reason that it's easy to fold is mostly because this gadget matrix um, multiplication relation is also linear. So it's very easy to fold. But for now, let's uh, consider a simple case. Well, we always assume that witness is always no normal, even in the beginning just for simplicity of our discussion, okay? And now we can simplify this relation to be the following. We want to check that this, uh, like this witness is a vector that's a correct opening to this commitment that satisfies this matrix multiplication relation and also have no norms. And here by no norm, I mean that every entry of this vector is in the range of minus beta and beta. Okay, so we figure out what kind of relation we want to fold. We figure out what kind of commitment scheme we want to use. Now the question is how to build a folding scheme. And let's assume that we have two instances with this pair that's in this particular uh, relation. And now the question is, can we reduce the checking of these two statements into one statement of the same relation? And the natural idea is just do a linear, random linear combination, right? Which is used in all this NOVA scheme, polar star, hypernova. However, since it becomes much more complicated in the last word, and this will no longer be in the same relation. Why? Because after this random combination, this folded witness can now have much larger norms. Even if you just consider addition, 
then the norm can go from beta to two beta. And things can get even worse if you just use some arbitrary random scalar. And that means after very few number of steps, this, the norm of this uh, folded witness can like quickly blow up and exceed some security thresholds for this assumption. Remember that for this assumption, it holds true for only if this, uh, if this uh, uh, solution you found is low norm. But now it is no longer low norm, so you will never have the binding property again. And actually, we'll also have some concrete attacks for this, meaning that if you close for many steps, there is actually no longer secure. So now we want something stronger, meaning that after this folding protocol, we want to make sure that this folded witness will still uh, have in the, exactly the same relation with non-bound beta. And our first idea to achieve it is to uh, massage or refresh this input witness a bit and to make their norm even lower before we do this random recombination, okay? And I will make that more formal, but we need to use some nice property about this reduction knowledge protocol, which says that it allows you to do a sequential composition. So say we have a reduction knowledge protocol that reduce R1 to R2 and another protocol reduce R2 to R3. And this theorem is saying that if you compose these two protocols together, that will give you a reduction protocol from relation R1 to R3. And now recall what is our original goal. Our original goal is to build a reduction knowledge protocol or folding scheme that reduce the checking of two statements in R type beta into one statement in R type beta. And given this sequential composition theorem, we can split the construction of pi into two parts. Well, in the first part, what we do is that we'll split these two instances with this pair into more instances with pair, like 2k, and here for simplicity, let's just consider four. And why we want to do that is that because after this splitting, I can make sure that witness of each statement is now having even lower norms, like which will be this p, which is smaller than beta. And after that, we'll design another, uh, like, carefully designed protocol that merge these four statements back to the one statements, then now we'll be still in the same relation R type beta. And then if we compose them together, we'll obtain what we want. So now the question is how to instantiate these two reduction knowledge protocols. And then I'll start with this, uh, um, uh, this splitting protocol or decomposition protocol first, which allows you to split two instances with this pair into 2K or four instances with this pairs. And for simplicity, let's just consider a simpler case. We'll just split one to two. And let's assume this parameter B is a square root beta. And our goal is to split a some input witness vector such that every entry of this vector is in the range of minus beta into two vector for which each of the vector will have even lower norm. And the idea is quite simple, which is quite similar to this gadget decomposition trick in FHG. And the idea is to write this big vector into two using this uh, base uh, base value B here. More precisely, for every entry of W, we'll do a division by B, which will give you some remainder and the quotient, right? And this vector of remainders and this vector of quotients will be exactly the vector you want that satisfies that every entry is in the range of minus B and B, because B is, uh, B is like square root of beta. And more, even better, if you multiply A by both sides, this equality will still hold by linearity matrix multiplication, which means that you can also check these combination relations easily on the commitment space. So that leads to the following protocol where the prover given this input witness, we are run this particular splitting algorithm to obtain W1, W2, and he obtain the corresponding commitments of C1, C2 and send it to the very file. And the very file will check that C1, C2 is consistent with this input commitment C. And if that holds true, he'll accept and output C1, C2. So it's easy to see that satisfy completeness because W1, W2 by honest prover is indeed a correct opening of C1, C2 with norm lower than B here. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, Dara. Do, does the verifier also have to check that the decomposition has been done correctly? Uh, no, you only need to check that it's this, uh, this particular uh, commitment relation and you'll see why. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I see one, yeah, yeah. carry on. So yeah, I, I'll explain that for knowledge soundness. I guess that's related to their question. So I want to prove this knowledge soundness, right? For any arbitrarily uh, generated W1, W2 that's in the output relation, meaning that there are correct opening of C1, C2 that have lower norm B. What we do is that the extractor can just uh, uh, output W1 plus B, W2. And uh, 
not that extractor actually knows like half access of this of this malicious prover, so he actually knows W1, W2, right? And you can make sure that this uh, W star is actually a correct opening for C because it satisfies the matrix multiplication relation, which is expanded here. And moreover, the norm of W star is uh, also lower than beta. So this W star will be in this input re relation, okay? So that will finish our proof that this is actually noise sound. Okay, uh, there is, you are, are you having a new question or? No, I saw you like- uh, Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah, I should lower my hand. Um, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I think I see. Okay, cool. So that's about the decomposition part. And the second part now is like, now we want to carefully design this fold protocol that turns back this uh, initial witness into a single witness that's in the relation of R type beta, okay? And still for simplicity, let's assume that we are focused on the two to one folding case. And now the, the nice thing about this new problem is that this input witness now is having even lower norm, okay? The norm is now B rather than beta, where B is much smaller than beta. But still need to need to be careful because if you do arbitrary random combination, this is still not going to work. So what we do is we actually will choose a small random scalar over a over a subset of this uh, change space. Uh, and then if you choose R to be small enough, then after folding, you can still control the norm of this folded witness so that it will still be smaller than beta. So the completeness will hold true. However, the issue is that. Uh, whether the knowledge soundness will hold true. And that's actually a very hard question. And to illustrate why it's hard, let's consider a typical way to do extraction. And let's, for simplicity, let's assume this prover, this malicious prover is actually very nice. Like for any folded commitments he, you give him, he will obtain a return of nice uh, witness for you, which is in this output relation that have a norm no, lower than beta. In this case, we can rewind this algorithm and feed it into two uh, folded commitments which uses two different random scalar, and, and he will return us two nice witness. And record our goal is to recover the W1, W2 here for the input statement, right? And to do that, a naive way to do that is to do this system of linear equations and to try to recover W1, W2. So we will solve this system of linear equations for, for W1, W2, and that will actually give some, us some unique and close form formula for W1, W2 which is pretty nice. And our hope is that this will be the W1, W2 we want, okay? But however, this will not work. The reason is that after this, uh, like this solution, this solution will actually have, possibly have large norm. Why? Because you, if you see this closed formula, even just consider the left-hand side, the bracket is the difference of two uh, vector whose norm is, can be as large as beta. And the difference can be as large as two beta, which is already much larger than the bound you want to achieve, which is B. So it's not gonna work. Okay, so that means this naive random combination will not give us security and our way to fix it is to add something more on top of it. So we'll run some range proof protocol uh, on top of this random linear combination. And the goal of this range proof protocol is to make sure that after the extraction, we can actually argue that the prover can never uh, use some large witness. This extract witness will actually have low norms. Otherwise, the prover will not be able to pass the verification easily. So to recap, like to rephrase a bit, the question we want to do is the following, where the prover, they were given some uh, like multiple input commitments like C1, C2, and the goal is to prove that I know some committed vector co for corresponding to these two commitments, that they satisfy this matrix multiplication relation, but moreover, this committed vector is having low norms, meaning that every entry of the vector is in the range of minus b and b here. And one way to achieve that is just to send, like completely open this, uh, this commitment, right? You just send this order vector to, of the commitments to the verifier, but that will work, but that not be efficient. So that will violate our last requirements here in the sense that we want to be, make sure that in the corresponding folding protocol, the verifier circuits will be very, very efficient so that we can never afford to have a linear sized verifier. And our solution is to combine our previous uh, idea, which is do this random linear combination plus rewinding extraction, and also add a range protocol. So the first uh, requirement is very easy to achieve using random combination and rewinding extraction. But 
the key functionality of range proof is that it enables you to also prove the second property, meaning that committed vector will have no norms. And now the question is how to instantiate this range proof protocol. And our idea is to do it through some check. So what is some check? Some check is a problem for which there is a verifier he wants to be convinced that given some committed polynomial, like committed multivariate polynomial G here, which have multiple formal variables, one, uh, XM, X1 to Xm, they want to check that the evaluation of G inside the Boolean hypercube, the sum of the evaluation of this, uh, of this uh, evaluation in the Boolean hypercube equals some claim value. And there's one naive way to achieve that, right? Given this some black box, given this Oracle access to this committed polynomial, we just query the evaluation of G at every point inside this Boolean hypercube of zero, one to the N, and then you compute the sum yourself and check if equal S or not. But this definitely is not very efficient, which is has two to the M complexity. But it turns out with the help of some possibly malicious prover, the verifier can be uh, like much, much cheaper. So this is exactly the sum check protocol, which is a multi-run protocol between a possibly malicious prover and an honest verifier. And in each run of this protocol, the verifier only needs to send an example of small random elements and send you the verifier and do some basic and really, really cheap computation. And that means this sum check protocol will have really efficient verifier. And at the end of this protocol, it now suffices for the verifier to just query this polynomial G at a very single random point. And if that evaluation holds some kind of uh, equality, then he can be convinced that his initial sum check uh, statement will hold true as well, even if the malicious prover is, uh, even if the prover is malicious. So in some sense, you can see here that this sum check protocol can be understood as some reduction protocol, right? Well, we want initially we want to check some sum check statements, but after running this protocol, now it suffices to just check some random evaluation statements. So it's a reduction protocol from the sum check statements to evaluation statements. So that's the background about what sum check is and what sum check protocol is. And now the question is like get back to our initial questions: how to obtain a range proof statement from sum check? And we achieve this in two steps. The first step is to, to re rephrase these range proof statements as a sum check statement. And the second step is to build a proof knowledge or efficient folding protocol for this particular sum check statements. Okay, so what is a range proof statement? Range proof statement is saying that given some commitments, which will commit some uh, corresponding committed vector, I will want to check for this committed vector, every entry of this vector is in the range of this minus B and B. Okay, so that's what a range proof statement is. And our first step is to retranslate this in, into algebraic uh, check. The idea is to introduce this polynomial H, which is the product of these many terms, X, X plus one, plus one X minus one, so on. And you can see here that H of X will be zero if and only if X, this integer input X is in the range of minus B and B. Because if it's in the range, one of the term will be zero, so the product will be zero. Otherwise, the product will not be zero. So now the, this statement is the same as the following. When we want to check for every entry of this committed vector, h of, of fi equals zero, right? And then uh, this is for arithmetic over integer, but it's fine to replace it with arithmetic over a prime field for efficiency. And now what we do in the next step is just some syntactical change. Okay, yeah, Dara. Oh, uh, you're muted, sorry. Uh, you don't need to answer this right now, but I was wondering um, how the security depends on Q. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, how, how big does Q need to be? Q usually, like, uh, uh, as long as, because B is really small, right? And here you see here that as long as the Q here uh, can be small, but uh, when in our initial, uh, our final solution, we'll use a polynomial ring. So Q actually, 32 bits, Q is enough usually. 32 bit prime for Q or 64 bit for prime is, is enough. And you, you might wonder, you might wonder why it gives you uh, security and soundness, but I'll explain more later because to like, like in short is because we use a polynomial, polynomial ring and we do a sum check over a ring. And this ring itself is large enough to give you, to give you enough uh, number of securities. I see. So, so Q itself doesn't need to be. Yeah. Q large. itself doesn't need to be large. Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, so from this, our next step is just to have a syntactical change. Well, we review this statement over a vector as a statement over a multilinear polynomial. This is because for every vector, there's a there, there's a map between a vector with a multilinear polynomial of uh, log n variables. Basically, you just map the first entry to the first evaluation of this uh, multilinear polynomial in the, in the Boolean hypercube, and map the second entry to the second evaluation inside this Boolean hypercube, and so on. So now you can re, like, understood these vector statements uh, like differently to see it as a zero check statement for some multivariate polynomial. So what does it mean? So it means that now in, instead of checking HF1, HF2 are zero, we just need to check that for this composed multivariate polynomial H of, of X, the evaluation of it inside this Boolean hypercube are zero everywhere, right? Then that's equivalent to the initial statement we want to prove. And we have some classical trick to transform this zero check over multivariate polynomial into the sum check statements over multivariate polynomial. Um, and that finally we get some sum check statements. And if this sum check statement holds true, if and only if, like informally say the sum check holds, holds true, if and only the initial range proof statement holds true. So this, we finish our first step and we translate this uh, range proof statement as sum check statements. Now the question is how do you build a proof knowledge or a folding protocol for this particular sum check statement. And of course, our starting point is exactly this sum check protocol I mentioned earlier, which is super efficient. And as I mentioned before, it's also reduction protocol from the sum check statements to this evaluation statements for this polynomial G here, where G is defined as follows. And we can make it even simpler here in the sense that we only need to check some evaluation statement for this multilinear polynomial F here which embeds this initial commutative vector f1 to fn. The reason why that's sufficient is because the structure of G is really nice. Suppose we have the evaluation of f at some point r, then we can recover the evaluation of G very easily at point r by just compute this h of t times eq of r. Both of them are really e uh, efficient to compute that can be computed by a verifier herself. So finally, we reduce the last problem how we can check that for this committed vector or this committed multilinear polynomial f, the evaluation statements at some random point r is correct, okay? And one naive thing is, again, just to open, like completely open this multilinear polynomial or this vector f and send to the verifier and the verifier to check it. But that's not gonna be efficient because this complexity is at least linear to the size of the vector because even one evaluation of multilinear polynomial has linear complexity. And our key observation is that you actually don't need to check it right away. The idea is to fold these kind of evaluation statements and only delay the checking till the very end. So the question is why we can fold this evaluation statement for Martin polynomial. So say we have two committed polynomial, F1, F2, and two points, random points R1, R2, and want to check these two evaluation statements. And now we'll go to reduce the checking of these two statements into one. The idea is to is following. Well, for each evaluation statement, we can actually understand it as a sum check statement. This is by this famous Martinini extension theorem, which is like similar to the Lagrange theorem in the universe case, which is saying that for any arbitrary evaluation of Martinini polynomial, this evaluation can actually be interpolated given the evaluation over the Boolean hypercube using this EQ polynomial here, which is analog of Lagrange polynomial in the multivariate case. So now you have two sum check statements and you can now run the sum check protocol again and that will reduce you to a uh, random evaluation statements on some multivariate polynomial that's related to F1, F2 and EQR1 and EQR2, right? But you can see this EQR1 and EQR2 are something very efficiently computable. So actually what you need to check finally uh, is just these two statements for F1, F2 at the same random points. RO, where R is this sum check challenge vector. And now we are do something uh, like do something meaningful here. We reduce the checking of two points, evaluation of two points into the checking of two polynomial at the same point. And finally, because this committed polynomial is homomorphic, we can do a randomly combination and translate it into a single evaluation statement for the folded committed polynomial FFD here. So this is how you do the folding for two evaluation statements. So now we'll get back to the initial questions. How does it help with you to check that this multilinear evaluation statements holds true, right? 
And as I said before, the idea is not checking it at all. We just fold these statements, fold these two evasion statements into one, and only like fold this again and again, and only at the very last step, we'll check it naively in a linear time, but in a, the amortized complexity is much smaller. Okay, so that's the way how you do folding for evaluation statements. And now let's get back, I'll get back to the initial questions on how to obtain a folding for this committee and opening relation. To do that, we actually need to do a slight change on this uh, folding statement we want to uh, define. So we actually, will, at every step, we'll maintain some accumulated statements or folded statements, which not only includes a folded commitment opening relation statement, but one more evaluation statement for the corresponding committed polynomial. And at each fold step, whenever you have some online statements you want to uh, fold, and then the, now the question is how to fold these two statements in the relation, in these two relation into one uh, statement in this R eval B relation. And as I mentioned before, Basically, these two statements are just a bunch of matrix simplification statements, range proof statements, and evaluation statements. And as I mentioned before, you can definitely use a random recombination trick plus the sum check protocol to finally reduce all the statements in the check of a single commitment open relation statements for a folded polynomial and one last evaluation statements. That's basically the last evaluation statement you need to check in this, uh, in this batch sum check. And that will be an our updated accumulated statements that will be used for the next folding step. And the highlight here is that this folding verifier complexity is actually concretely very efficient. It's only logarithmic to the length of the witness vector. And it's actually the auto operation is native and it is very, very uh, simple, just basically some like multiplication and additions. And I, one thing I want to note here is the actual knowledge proof is not uh, that simple, it's more subtle than this intuition. The reason is because in the folding scheme, you know that for malicious prover, the moment that he output this folded openings, right, folded witness, is after he knows these sum check uh, challenges. But when we do this rewinding based extraction, we are extracting from these outputs, right? So basically that means the extracted witness we get is actually depend on these sum check challenges. But some check sum sum is usually saying that given some fixed polynomial over the randomness of some check ch uh, challenges, some sum check statements should not hold true or something like that. So, but here, like the 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 input witness are actually uh, correlated to some check challenges. So it's more subtle to give a, a proof for that. But actually, we can do do that given thanks for the binding property of the commitment schemes. But uh, I, I will refer to more like details in our paper though. Uh, by the way, we will have a update for the, our paper very soon, so we will keep, keep everyone posted. Okay, so that's basically the general idea. But as I mentioned before, it's a very, very simple scheme and in a very, very simple setting. Uh, first, we are only dealing with prime field and integer before, but actually in practice, what we will do is that we will instantiate these other commitments over a ring, which is the cyclotomical rings uh, of dimension D. Uh, where D usually is a power of two to make it more efficient. And also remember, we need to do this random combination, right? And we need this, this random scalar to be really small, have no norms. And that means we have to chosen that from a large set over the polynomial ring in order to make sure that we have enough uh, soundness errors here, like soundness security here. So the subset should be very large and this is impossible to do it if you just sample it from ZQ. So that all means that the sum check should be over rings rather than over fields. And we can instantiate that uh, over rings without too much more complexity. And that also answers uh, Darrow's questions before on that we can actually support small Q but still have enough number of security for sum check using rings. And the second part is also quite related. So basically in practice, we want a small modulus Q, right? Because we want to obtain like enable efficient CPU and GPU in operations and avoid big number asthmatics. We can actually achieve that. And I think both like 32 bits Q or prime Q or 64 bit prime Q should work. And another byproduct is that it now allows you to do more efficient packing of real world data. We just pack this data into the this uh, each slots of this polynomial ring. And then every every slot is just 32 bits rather than uh, 256 bits. Okay, and one final thing is that uh, I mentioned before, you actually have to do a folding for this MP-complete relation, 
which allows you to represent this computation for chunk statements and folding verification. And we actually support that. And this uh, MP compilation is a generalization of this customizable constraint system introduced by Srinas, Riot, and Justin Taylor. Uh, and we extend that to the ring setting. So basically, this, in this constraint system, all the constraints can be represented over operations, over ring operations, rather than field operations. And this makes uh, it very awesome, very nice for applications like uh, verifiable machine learning and fully homework encryption, for which the operation we want to prove is done over a ring rather than over a field. Okay, so one last word about the efficiency of our scheme. So compared to those existing Peterson-based schemes, what we have done is that we replace these Peterson commitments with uh, ITA commitments. And what that means is we remove this many elite curve scale multiplication over a large field, which is quite expensive with these ring operations over quotient polynomial rings. Usually it's cyclotomic power of two cyclotomical rings, which can actually be super fast. And even better, we have so many really nice and sophisticated FHC libraries and hardware optimizations. And we can migrate some of the, those uh, tricks there and to make this fold improver even more blazingly fast. And for the folding verifier, the key metric, oh, oh yeah, Dara? Yeah, so um, you have the, so is the B here the same as the B earlier that was the um, the the smaller bounds and beta? Yes, small bounds of beta and okay. B is some dynamic parameter you can choose. And in our work, usually what you choose is just choose B equals two or four. I think that's uh, that's the nice. Uh, I, I think you had on the, the previous slide um, that, uh, beta was of the order of b squared? Does it... Yeah, that's just for example. Like, uh, oh, you... I see, right, yeah. yeah. Because okay. you, in that case, you split... It can be much smaller. Yeah, yeah you, you just split 1 to 2, but you can split 1 to k, right? And then you can make, uh, make the b even oh, smaller. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Yeah. For example, if beta is 2 to the six, uh, 16, and if, for example, if b is, uh, say, 4, and then the you just split 1, one to 4, right? Because... Oh, because uh, four to the four is uh, sixteen. Because uh, uh, right, okay, yeah. I think okay, yeah. I think either four or eight, but yeah. I think it's probably eight. Yeah, probably. B to the k. Uh, B to the k is. I think B to the k is B, yeah. Is I think it's an eight. Yeah, yeah four to the eight right. is two to the right. sixteen. Yeah. Yeah. Eight. yeah, yeah. But this is something you can you can like. Tune yourself. You just yeah. find the, the sweet spot you want. Yeah. Okay. So um, for the verifier, for the folding verifier, the key metric is the circuit complexity of this folding verifier, right? And the really nice property about our scheme is that the sum check verifier, basically, they only do every operation doing here is only over a single quotient ring here. Okay. So that means the corresponding circuit does not need to do anything like any non native field operations. And this is a great advantage compared to those Peterson-based schemes, which needs to do non native field emulations. And that's also the key reason why we can actually obtain some really competitive circuit sizes for the folding verifier as well. So that's why last fold, even though it, uh, like, any, like usually when you see this is post com secure, it's less based, you might think that's not very efficient, but it turns out in this case, can actually be very efficient. And one last thing about this piecemeal snark construction is that, which is actually some folklore trick here, is that if you if you do this, uh, do the techniques I mentioned before, finally the prover needs to send some folding uh, folding instance with a pair to the verifier, and the verifier needs to check it. And what if it, this folded instance with a pair is still large, right? Which is possible for some kind of really large computation. Say you have a computation that involves two to forty gates. And even if you split them into two to twenty chunks, each chunk can still be large as large as two to twenty. So in that case, it's still pretty large. But you can use some very classical trick to compress it further. Finally, what you do is just use another monolithic snark proof to generate one single proof for these chunk statements, for these folded chunk statements, to prove that it will be correctly verified by the verifier. And then you can instead of sending the folding instance with the pair, you can just send a corresponding proof proof that this folding with pair will be checked correctly. And this folding witness will be just secret witness for this snark proof. And the reason why it's still very efficient is because now you only need to generate one single monolithic snark proof for one single chunk statement. 
So it's basically, it's nothing. I think it's a negligible overhead compared to the all other works where you need to deal with a really, really large statement initially. And that means finally you can get some proof that whose size is at only like 100 kilobytes if you use the constraint based uh, fry based proofs. And it was also very efficient to verify. And if you don't care about post com security, okay, then you can even do better. You just use some other uh, like pre quantum snark scheme like Plunk or Hyperplunk, and that give you, can give you something like one to five kilobytes proof sizes and very easy to verify. So, in sum, uh, the key takeaway here is we introduced this first last space for this team based on other commitments. And finally, it gives you some very memory efficient and post common secure snarks with ultra fast prover, small proof sizes, and really ship very fast. Uh, and before talking about open problems, I want to mention the concurrent work here. I think uh, like Benedict and Pratchush, William and Wilson, they also mentioned, they also present this talk before in the study club. So what they do is they introduce a new accumulation scheme or phone scheme that is purely from hashing and is not based on these homomorphic commitments, uh, which is pretty nice because that means even you don't even need less crypto here, even though in our case, this last crypto is pretty lightweight, it's also pretty efficient. But I think uh, that's also not that's not going to be uh, be more efficient than just doing hashing because hashing usually is pretty efficient. Like SHA-3 is pretty fast. And they also mentioned some general optimization techniques for building piecemeal snarks that can equally well apply to LESFOR to make it even more efficient. Um, but there's one trade-off here uh, in the sense that they will involve much larger folding verified circuits because they need to perform many, many hash operations because they are coding based. And that's what well needs to a really large verified circuit. And second, they only support bounding number of folding steps. And particularly if you fold more than bounded the number of steps, there will actually exist some concrete attacks for that. While in this while this con concrete attack will never work for, for Nova, for Protostar, for Let's Fold, or for Hypernova, for those homomorphic based um, folding schemes. Yeah, Dara. Yeah. Um... There's another relevant um, concurrent work, I think, which is mm -hmm. um, I slid into the chat. That's um, ePrint 2024-306 um, by... Oh, I see. Wang, the... uh, uh, sorry. Um, I see. So you are uh, with, uh... Wang, uh, sorry, I, I, sorry, I won't butcher <laughs> the, um, the Korean names, but um, I think what they're constructing is a homomorphic... Um, lattice space commitment. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I think there's yeah. PCS, right? Is there, there are PCS? Uh, sorry, can you expand uh, PCS? Oh, polynomial commitments. Um, are they constructing yes, polynomial yes, they commitments? Are. Yeah, actually, there are, there are several concurrent work for that. Like, for example, I think Caltech, yeah. they also have a, a new paper uh, in this crypto that build a more efficient polynomial commitment scheme from Lattice. And this is another one. I think they also get accepted from by crypto. But there's a key, key difference from their work with this work because yeah. they are mostly related, like uh, their, their work is mainly for building a polynomial commitment schemes, which use some techniques from folding. But mm -hmm. our, our scenario is more strict. Like we need to build a phone scheme for this general MP statements. Okay. So like you can use- Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, you can use polynomial commitment scheme to build FSNARCs, but like starting from polynomial commitment scheme from Lattice is not tri trivial that you can build a folding scheme for arbitrary MP statements. And then one key difference why it's harder here is because you need to make sure after folding, the folded witness is exactly in the same relation, has the same bond. There's no, no slack, no blow, blow up in, in, the, in the witness uh, norm here. But in their works and in both of works, they actually allow some kind of blow up in every round because in a, in a PCS, the number of rounds, the number of folding rounds usually is only logarithmic. Like oh, I see. Yeah. So so in that case, it's fine to have some blow up, and as long as this blow up is small, then you can make sure this scheme is still quite efficient. And their their main contribution exactly they control this non blow up uh, in a better way than all the pre pre, pre, uh, pre state of the art work, which makes this PCS um, more efficient than previous live space PCS. I think I would I would consider this some orthogonal work, which is not comparable. Yeah. yeah. Right, because the, yeah, the, the goal is different. Yeah. Cool. OK. 
okay, uh, yeah, so also there are many uh, nice open problems. And one thing I want to mention is like, it would be great to ha have like some very efficient implementation for this and to justify its efficiency. I think like in terms of efficiency, I think it's quite promising. I guess the key question is whether we have enough number expertise for a software engineer to know this very, very deep knowledge about the uh, lattice and FHE and to actually um, instance in a very efficient way. And I'm hoping to see more uh, implementation for that and make sure uh, I finally see some really nice implementation for last vote, which uh, I think is quite promising. And another question is whether we can do a voting for a wider class of uh, relation. So we already consider MP complete the relation. So like in theory, this is already sufficient. It can represent arbitrary computation, but for concrete efficiency, this is there's still some gap here. It would be nice if you can directly folding this table lookup relation, for example, very directly and very efficiently. That would be very useful for many applications like uh, um, proving char, char circuits or something like that. And I think this is actually very promising because recently there's a work called Lasso, which is really nice work that allows you to do a uh, lookup arguments uh, from some check. And actually their framework is quite compatible with our framework. Well, we both rely on some check. And I, I, I totally believe that it can be extended to less full setting as well. And finally, is the, this question, whether we can have a commitment scheme that satisfies these two key properties I mentioned before. First is compressing, which means you can compress a long string into a short string, and second, meaning homomorphic. And in the last word, we have this one, right? We have R tied to satisfy these both uh, properties. But the issue here is we have some norm constraints, as mentioned before. And that's also the main reason why we need to go do this like complicated routes for doing splitting and doing range proof, right? But what if we have some really nice lattice based commitments that has no norm constraint at all, but also satisfy these two properties? If that's the case, we can just like replace Peterson commitments with these lattice commitments and do nothing change on Nova or Protostar or Hypernova. And that would be great because you don't need to do any extra work but uh, you can already enjoy the advantage of using less commitments, which have really lost a uh, fast prover and the native uh, ring operations, like uh, really, really nice circuits. And that can, if that's the case, we can, uh, we can just replace like Nova with this kind of a lattice low Nova. And uh, the, the, the engineering work is minimal. It just, it just replaced this uh, uh, Pearson commitments with this commitments. And you can just reuse the Nova implementation. That would be a dream goal, and in that case, I guess lattice fold will be just useless. Okay, uh, but I'm I'm look I'm happy to see that happens because that would be making this scheme even better. Um, but I think this is a really challenging question, though, and that would be a great breakthrough if you can find we can find such a lattice based commitment scheme. Yeah, Dara. I I mean my my experience is that um, it it's um what am I trying to say. It's always useful to to bear in mind um, the ideas that have been used in previous work. Um, yeah, so it's course. not that it would be um, useless because you can probably <laughs> combine some of the ideas here yeah, sure, with sure. the um, the instantiation of um, say Nova or Hypernova um, with another lattice commitment and um, mm -hmm. get something even better still. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, definitely. But I think you, this would be a really nice question, but I think it's a really, really challenging question because uh, usually in the last word, if you consider this a cis assumption, like you, you have to consider some norm constraints somewhere. Like how to get rid of that is really, really a, a challenging question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take more questions now. And really thank you for, for listening. And oh, one thing to mention is that we are expecting to update our ePrint draft very soon. And I uh, will keep everyone updated on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, what are the updates? Uh, the update many is like uh, previously, we only give a sketch proof for, for this uh, folding, which I only consider two to one setting. But now I give a more formal, like more foolproof for the K to one setting. It turns out to be actually not that. Uh, not that trivial, uh, actually need some care. And beyond that, uh, I also have some like fix some typos and add some other remarks for, for details. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I, will, I would uh, explain what other changes in the Twitter later, but uh, yeah. I think that's a major changes.
Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about what the trade off um to the optimal k is. Um, so what? I think in our instantiation, I, I, usually um, there's a trade off of k, but uh, in our all instantiation, usually um, like you just make k, you just make b to be small enough. I think that's fine because uh, the bottleneck so, as mentioned be here is just some check verify complexity. So, so what's controlling the size of uh, beta? Uh, beta is related to the cis hardeners, these lattice hardeners. So beta is, ah, okay. uh, yeah, you cannot be, um, make beta too large because if you make beta too large, we will no longer have a binding property for other commitments. Yeah. Do, do you know what that is um, asymptotically compared to say the ring size? Or... Uh, you mean what's the ring size of? Uh, yeah. Micro? Oh, I, see. I, I guess I guess that's getting into too much detail about the the concrete hardness of um, uh, yeah so SIS. I, we we do have some instantiation in our paper. I think we consider a sixty four bit primes, and uh, the polynomial ring has dimension about sixty four. I guess yeah. So you can understand the polynomial ring just as a vector space or module over a over a field, right? Over a field multiple field elements. And uh, it's basically a, a vector of field elements you can understand as a ring using the entity transform. And in our case, every element, field elements is some 60 bit, 64 bit primes, and there are 64 uh, of them. And they actually, I think there, if you like, if you calculate more carefully, they can be more aggressive uh, uh, instantiation. For example, you can use just 32 bit primes with uh, maybe 64 bit dimension. There's, there's some kind of, kind of instantiations. And the one thing I do want to note here is that all our paper is only working over power of two cyclotomic rings. And this is usually the, the case for most of the applications, for example, in FHE, because they are super efficient. You know, like power of two uh, like cyclotomic rings make the NTT to be really, really efficient. And actually, I think this kind of scheme can be extended to more general case. Like you can use other prime fields and you can use non-power of two second term rings. But I think uh, it's just that we haven't formally proved it, but I think it should be work as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess the other optimization parameter is the degree of the um, constraints that you're supporting in CCS? Uh, uh, the, so, the, so the, DAG in the paper. Uh, degree DEG, DEG in the yeah. paper. That's that's the degree of the constraint system. Uh, here, what I mean is yes. the D. So you can see here, like this RQ here, RQ here. This is the quotient ring we care about. For example, mm -hmm. this would be a ZQX. Divide, divide modular x to 64 plus 1, and it's isomorphic to fq to the 4, 16. So it's basically like, uh, it's like a, a dimension 16 vector space with uh, with the extension field of q to the 4. So that's, so this 64 is the dimension of this, of this ring here. Yeah, basically. Is that oh, clear? I see. Yeah. Yes. And actually, you might wonder, actually, this is much hot, larger than a single field element, right? But uh, but actually, this uh, this is fine because one single ring element can actually pack multiple field constraints. Like it can pack multiple field elements. For example, here, it can, it's basically one one ring element corresponds to 16, 16 field elements. And you can put 16 field elements inside and it can represent 16 field constraints inside a one single ring constraint. So it's actually um, pretty pretty efficient. The the reason. So, can... so how does the um, the number of CCS? So, so the CCS constraint system is over which ring again? It's Sorry. over over RQ. Is over RQ. I see. Okay. Yeah, and one CCS constraint over RQ can be used to represent sixteen CCS constraint over a field. Right. Yeah. yeah, I get it. Yeah. Um, 
so so is that basically doing a kind of a SIMD operation yes, over exactly. the field elements? Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. Huh. So that it's interesting how to optimize circuits in that model. Um yeah. yeah, I guess you use similar techniques that you use in SIMD um outside circuits. Yes, yes, exactly. Hmm. Yeah. I guess that's uh like maybe creates a new word for, for engineer to explore. <laughs> that can be interesting, I think. Yeah, I'm just looking at um, the efficiency comparison with no hypernova and protostar in the paper. Uh, I I very much appreciate that you've given um, exact number of constraints here, um, because um, th that's the information that um, the engineers need to um, ask. Do I think I can do better than this? On mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's uh, some, in a given like, amount of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And that's just some rough estimate, but I think it can be some guidance yeah. for engineers. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Any uh, any more questions from anybody? All right. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Uh, Dara, thank you for all of your thoughtful questions, as always. Benny, thank you very much for this work. And um, yeah, really appreciate you presenting today. And thank you, Alex. Looking forward to having you back. You, you've become pretty prolific with these papers. So I guess we'll be having thank you too. back here without, without too much delay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you guys all thank very much.